this week on the Backtable Podcast. Believe me, there are a lot, a lot of problems from the metallic things that are inside the ink of the scrubs that we wear that can distort the magnetic field to the devices that we can use to the position of the patient, even to understanding the entry point or the coil you have to use. It's hard, but I mean, if it's not difficult, it's not exciting. The only exciting things in life are things that are difficult. Easy things are for all, all people. We are new radiologists. We prefer to do more tough things, more difficult things. That's the, the salt of life. Welcome to the Backtable Podcast, your source for all things interventional and otherwise minimally invasive. You can find all previous episodes on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Backtable.com. First, a brief message from our sponsor. RadPad was developed by physicians for physicians. Clinically proven radiation protection during cine and digital subtraction and geography. Don't bet your career or your health on anything less. Trust RadPad radiation protection shields for all your floral guided interventions. See radpad.com for more information and contact info at radpad.com for a free radiation evaluation and a no-brainer radiation protection cap. And don't forget to tell them that you heard about it on the Backtable podcast. Now, back to the episode. We're back with part two in this series. This is your host, Jacob Fleming, reported from Dallas, Texas. Dr. Manfrey, thank you so much for your time and welcome to the show. Generally speaking, what I do for every procedure, not only spacer, but particularly for spacer, we have to do local anesthesia, obviously. So we use spinal needle. So the lateral spinal needle that I put, for me, is important for injecting the lidocaine. What is important to understand angulation and entry point. So I put the spinal needle. When I see from the CT that the spinal needle is in the proper way, pointing to the, my target, then I introduce my guy wire. And then I check with my CT. When the guy wire is, is in, in between the two spinous process, and I do my CT scan, and I see that the guy wire is even scratching the facet, so as deep as possible, because you cannot go in between the facet area, obviously. So when you scratch the facet, you know that you are in the right place. Then you start the rest of the procedure with the CR. But I use the CT because it, I found it honestly easy. It's like for vertebroplasty. The most of the time, the main percentage of time you spend is putting the needle in the proper area. Okay, I put the needle with the CT. So I switch on the C-arm only to see when I inject the PMMA. But it's 10 seconds, no more. Yeah, and that, that's obviously uh, one of the things that is kind of inferior to the approach with CT is when you need something that you can dynamically monitor, like cement injection. That's the downside of the CT-only approach. And so I think that it's really worth emphasizing to our audience that these tools that are techniques that we have learned as radiologists, as interventional radiologists, and even just residency diagnostic radiology, these skills transfer over to the covert surgical approaches that you use. And the, the transition is direct. And so, for example, what you were just describing with getting the guide wire through the inner spinous space, which is, you know, a long path to go, but as long as you're very confident in your ability to keep a needle in plane and just go for it, it's duck soup. And so it reminded me of a, a case I did the other day. It was much less complicated, but it was a lumbar puncture and intrathecal medication administration on a patient who was quite large and had a spinal muscular atrophy. So we were limited by the patient's uh, spinal posture as well as the large amount of soft tissue. And so we needed to use a seven inch needle to get into place through a transferaminal approach. And so I'd never done a transferaminal LP before. I mean, there's, there's very few reasons to need to do that. And it was my first time honestly driving a seven inch needle. But as long as on the axial plane, you identify your entry point and your target and then just go straight down and are confident in your, your techniques with needle craft in making the slight adjustments to compensate for the bend that this wobbly seven inch needle is going to have. 
you just transfer that over and it's just very obvious. So that was the first time I'd done that, but I felt I was really excited when I got the needle, the entire needle in plane on one slice. And of course, that's exactly what you're doing is just getting this guide wire path straight across. And once you, once you realize that's it, that's kind of it. And that technique it just gets applied again and again in the surgical approaches that you do. And then of course, it's kind of followed by the, the soft tissue dilation. So could we talk about that a little bit? You get, you get the guide wire in, and at that point, you're progressively putting in soft tissue dilators until you maximize a- and have kind of this tube going through the patient's five millimeter incision. Is that the maximum that you're going up to? Exactly. Five, six maximum. We enter with a dilator. Then there is a dilator that is a sort of a delivery system. So the system is projected to go in between the two spinous process. So you get the area in between the two spinous process, then you have to size. Because, I mean, you cannot judge the proper size of a spacer because you know the spacers are different. We got 8 millimeter spacer, 10, 12, 14. So it depends on the patient. There are people where you can put a 12 millimeter spacer, and there are people where even 8 is too much. But how to size? You cannot size the patient using the CT. I mean, it's not, you cannot measure the image because all these people got the two spinous process just in contact. Most of them just got the, the spinous process in contact. So what we do is entering and there is a sort of a sizer, a sort of a stuff that you put in between. And these sides are three or four and are larger and larger and larger. So when we find the maximum size that can enter inside in between the two spinous process, we know the maximum size of the spacer that generally speaking is between 8 and 12. Okay, 8, 10 or 12. Very rarely I put a 14, never put a 16, never in my life. But, but in, in any case, you size, then you tell your fellows or open one 10 millimeters, you mount the spacer on a spatial delivery system, you enter with the spacer, you get the midline, and with the new kind of spacer, you open things that fix the spacer in that area. But all the system is very, very easy because it's based on a delivery system that is identical to the delivery system of screws. So you have simply to unscrew the delivery system from the spacer when you are in the proper way, in the proper place. When the spacer is is in between the two spinous process, you simply detach it and remove it and remove all the system but the spacer. I repeat, it's really a very fast procedure, honestly. And according to me, it's not the most difficult procedure I do. I mean, it's more aggressive, the SIJ fusion, for example, or definitely transfaxectal fusion is definitely more difficult because you have to be extremely precise. It's a question of millimeters. When we are talking about spacer, it's not incredibly difficult, honestly. Sure, but very sophisticated, the approach. And I love that basically the entire thing is sort of an iteration of Seldinger technique, more or less, and getting that implant in and expanding it in minimally invasive fashion and when we were talking about the placement earlier and kind of how it works biomechanically, I think we sort of talked about it in terms of you're opening up the inner spinous space and performing an indirect decompression, which of course the direct decompression would be a laminectomy or laminotomy. And so the way this is accomplished is it increases the spinal canal and foraminal surface area by bringing things more into alignment. And so I do want to talk about alignment because I see this claim all the time. I know you're no stranger to it. And it's something I saw just the other day of a spinal surgeon kind of throwing this around with no data to back it up. But the idea of a spacer as kyphosis inducing. And I know you have something to say about that. So how how do you respond? It's one year that we have the weight bearing machine, the weight bearing system. So we evaluate people in the upright. And all my patients that are supposed to put a spacer, all my patients undergo an upright MR scan the day before, the day after. So number one, 
but I have to publish this. So this is something brand new, okay? But I got sufficient data to be published. Uh, I don't Hot have enough press. time. Not, not even on the press yet. Not on the press, exactly. But I showed this data in some conference. So number one, we demonstrated in our patient using the analysis that the machine does, the, not the spinal canal, nor the foramen, but the dural sac expand because it's an MR. So we don't measure the spinal canal like on CT. The machine measure for us the voxels inside this dural sac. And what we saw, and that the machine tell us that the mean, minimal, and maximal area in millimeter squared, okay, enlarged significantly the day after I got patient, generally speaking, the area is multiplied by 10 the day after. That means the day before was 7 millimeters squared. The day after is 78. I remember one patient I did two weeks ago. So it's something that you did because it's something that happened in 24 hours. So definitely is related to the spacer. So number one, <clears throat> we proved that the spacer enlarged the dural sac. Number one. Number two, I know that one perplexity from the literature was we put a spacer, we create in natural kyphosis. We got our revenge because there is a very elegant paper published on spine three years ago demonstrating that the spinal you say alignment and the, even the pelvic tilt, but I mean the posture of the patient after the spacer improved. So we don't create a kyphosis. It's even better simply because when you open the space, there is no more, I mean, pain for the brain. I mean, the brain understands that now he can be better in the upright position. You know that all the people with spinal canal stenosis try to say kyphotic position because they try to enlarge. But if we enlarge the space with a spacer, the brain knows, the brain understands that now it can be in the upright in a better way. So there is a, a very elegant paper saying this, and I'll tell you more. We got the results of our MR weight-bearing studies, and we evaluate not only the size of the dural sac, we evaluate the position of the vertebra, the lower doses, the listasis, and even the general alignment of all the spine. And we discover that we didn't increase the kyphosis and that we didn't reduce significantly the lower doses. Lower doses change around no more than five degrees, so nothing. And the third thing I was very, very, I mean, astonished when I saw these results was that in people with two stenosis, I mean, one severe and one mild, we put the spacer in one obviously in the worst stenosis, and the other stenosis improve spontaneously. That means that if we ameliorate the position of the spine, putting one spacer in one level is not only an improvement in one level, it's an improvement in the general spine morphology. We don't change a level, we change the spine morphology. This is very it's, according to me, is extremely important to understand because we do an action on the whole spine, touching one thing. And we, are, we, we have this very, very interesting, I mean, results demonstrating that the dural sac in the level that we didn't treat it, expand, enlarge the day after, I repeat, after putting a spacer even in another level. So probably we ameliorate all the general spine putting one single spacer. But definitely, definitely, we don't create kyphotic people. Obviously, if you see the woman I saw two months ago, 37. So, okay, 37 and spacer, they cannot marriage. You cannot put a spacer in a 37 girl, okay? It's, a, it's absurd. This woman had three spacer. She got kyphosis, but if you put three space, I don't put never more than two. 
And it's very rare, honestly. The patient where I put two spacers, okay? But never put three. Obviously, if you put three or four or five, you will create a natural kyphosis. But not if you put one, definitely. Oh, that's that's really amazing, the, the results that you talked about. I like how you explain that from the biomechanical standpoint that we're not just pulling things back or just shoving this thing in there to space open the inner spinous spaces. You're actually changing the topography of the spinal canal and, and the dural sac foramina and so on. And I think it seems to me that a lot of people don't really think about it from the dynamic aspect, which is that when you're putting the implant in, there's ligamentotaxis and things are kind of getting pulled into a more anatomic position. I think a lot of people just think that the the anterior column as a static structure. And when you put the spacer posteriorly, it's going to create this angulation, which what they think of is, is way more than what actually happens. And so you can see this a lot of times in the spacer. I've seen pictures where after it's employed, you can see disc vacuum gas because the disc is just totally, it's collapsed at first. And then once the spacer is put in, the disc actually expands and you see that vacuum phenomenon. That's true. But I'll tell you that I think that it, this depends on the size of the spacer you use. Because sometimes one of the main mistakes is putting a spacer that is too large. I know that, generally speaking, surgeons put spacer in the operating room. And you know how people, how patients are in the operating room. They used to be on a prone position, then the table, try to to be curved the way the spine is open. Okay, they, in Italy we say we crack the spine. That means we open in naturally the spine, creating a sort of a kyphotic position. Because in this kyphotic position, it's easier to go in between the two spinous process. My perplexity, and I did it did in the past, but I don't do it anymore. I don't put pillow pillow under the belly of the patient. Because if I create a kyphosis, when I do my sizing, probably I will use, I will choose a size that is too much. It's not natural. I don't want to create a kyphosis. I want to restore the normal position. The normal position is not the position you have when you have a pillow under your stomach. That's why I don't create a kyphotic patient to put a spacer in. I don't size this way the spacer anymore. I put the patient lying on the bed without in natural position. Then I size, I do my sizing. So the idea of creating kyphosis, increasing the stress in the anterior spine uh, column, damaging the disc, according to me, comes from an oversize, oversizing of the spacers, honestly. Yeah, sure. That makes a lot of sense. And you hear about the flexed positioning for spine procedures and surgeries a lot, and it can help in the procedure itself, like you said, to make it kind of easier technically. But as you said, like we've talked about with standing MRI, you and I is a kind of a fake position. It's not physiologic and could lead to oversizing the implant. So really good pearls there, both for the placement and some clinical pearls in regards to responses for the kyphosis, and we'll be sure to link to that paper in our show notes for our listeners. And thank you so much for the explanation of spacers so far. And it's plain to see why it's it's a powerful tool that can be used properly or misused if doing something like placing three spacers, but very powerful for the problem of spinal canal stenosis. But there's a new advancement now. The, the next evolution is the fusion spacer. And we've actually started to see this on the U.S. We do have one product on the market that does this. And so we're moving into the territory of spinal instability. So tell us about that and where the state of the art is at the moment. I'm very enthusiastic about this evolution. I use the American product. I know it powerful, extremely powerful. And in Europe, there is a new system. I think that is coming, coming out in the U.S. in a while. But the idea is that a lot of people that got spinal canal stenosis got instability. I mean, instability is always back in the kitchen of spinal canal stenosis. 
and particularly now that I use to use my way bearing upright MR, I see more and more and more people with spinal canal stenosis that when I evaluate them in the upright, they got listasis. But if I have listasis, spacer is not sufficient because the people got two diseases. They got listasis, so instability, and they got spinal canal stenosis. So I have to enlarge and I have to fix. So I have to do two things. Thanks God, this new kind of spacers does two things in one shot. I mean, you, uh, how do you say, you kill two birds with one stone. So, I mean, in Italy, it's something like similar. Yeah, exactly. I mean, exactly right. You know, I will never forget the mother of a friend of mine that was treated for three years from a psychiatric point of view because she said, I got pain in my leg and the MR was always normal. Then I analyzed the patient in the upright and she got a lysthesis, almost grade two, completely occult in the conventional MR. So it was an occult instability. And we used for the first time this kind of new spacer because when she was in the upright, she got listasis and obviously she got stenosis. If you have a listasis, you will have a stenosis for sure. So we put this the system and everything was blocked. Nowadays, we use it routinely in all the patients that got stenosis and listasis. And back again, we analyze all these people in the upright and we see that listasis the day after disappear. So this is the proof of fixation, not fusion. Fusion, nature will do the future. But fixation is immediate. And it's related to the blocking system that this new spacer has. So what we do is block the two spine. In my idea, as we are talking about the future. My idea is there are a lot of new stuff in the market that are coming out about percutaneous fixation of the percutaneous cage. So if you want to do a 360 degree fixation, okay, you can put four screws, two rows and, per- and cage, or probably in the future, in coming future, we will block the posterior spine with a spacer that blocks, so with a fixation spacer, and we will block the anterior spine with percutaneous cage. I mean, this is my idea. But up to now, the reality, I mean, the real life is that we have spacer that does an incredible, powerful fixation. So we are not supposed to treat only the spinal canal stenosis. We can treat the stability in a very elegant way Because at the end of the story, it's always a 3 minutes and 30 seconds procedure. Even the blocking procedure is fast, as fast like a spacer is. So it's really, really a very interesting evolution of the spacer. And I'm enthusiastic about this. I mean, for me, that use spacer from 2006. So it's more than 15 years that I put spacer. This is revolutionary, definitely. It's extremely exciting to hear about. And again, we do have one device here in in the U.S., but I think as the devices continue to iteratively evolve, which has been your career has been seeing that as it's happened, that sounds really exciting. I know it's going to be really exciting over the next few years seeing companies try to outdo each other and do the thing that's a, a step above in terms of being the best. And love that you mentioned the percutaneous 360 fixation and fusion. Uh, that's something Dr. Beal brought up on the show previously. And we just uh, throw that out there. Another little David Goliath thing with our spine surgeon friends. And again, all that in the context of what we discussed earlier about proper patient selection. And a lot of times using these in very ill patients, like you said, a lot of the patients you treat are elderly, multiple comorbid conditions that just make traditional spine surgery, not a great alternative for them. And it's been great. I've been hearing about certain things with awake spine surgery and things like that. It's great. But I do think that, you know, there's been a natural progression towards doing things in the least aggressive manner and the, which the spacer is, I feel like it epitomizes that and when used appropriately. And, you know, we talked about this earlier with uh, some of the criticisms and, and things and some surgeons saying that they don't like the spacer because they had to remove 
several of them, which I hear this a lot. And like we discussed earlier, if you're using the device improperly, it's not going to succeed uh, because it's it's not the right tool for the job. And so I think what you're saying makes a lot of sense in pushing this covert surgery even further. I think that's just the logical next step. And my response to the surgical community who would say, that, hey, that's that's a step too far. We're the only ones who do arthrodesis of the spine. I think that it has to be all couched properly in our background in image guidance and fundamental understanding of biomechanics. So I don't really feel like that's something that should be done by any interventional pain physician, nor do I really think that's likely for that to happen. Everyone kind of has their technical comfort level. And you've been working on these procedures your entire career and perfecting these approaches. And with the image guidance, a lot of it's relatively simple. But it seems to me that the subset of people who would be even be practicing that technique is going to be pretty small. But I don't know. Do you do you agree with that or do you see it in a different way? No, no, no. I I fully agree with you. I mean, the the critical thing is that I repeat, uh, it's not a difficult procedure. But we have to be extremely, I mean, severe in the selection of patients. I mean, spinal canal stenosis, it's, I think that I see at least 10 patients every week with spinal canal stenosis. So obviously, I don't put a spacer a week, simply because not all the patients should be treated. That's the key. I mean, you should be, should, should be extremely, extremely selective. It's the only way to, otherwise, we will do a lot of mistakes. And things we will improve in the future. I do believe making the procedure even easier and probably, as I told you, using something different from the city. Because, you know, I'm working on, uh, on a new project that I showed uh, to people that comes to my hands on, for example. Because my idea is, okay, wh- wh- which, is the best, which is the best machine to look to the spine? Come on, it's MR. So will you imagine to do some MR treatment, MR guided treatment? That's my idea. I'm working from one year to to this project. I think that I'm close to the end, but I will not tell you anything else. Otherwise, you will not invite me anymore in this podcast and I want to come back. (laughs) Oh, no. There's no question. You'll be back. We'll we'll definitely uh, (laughs) hope that you come back to discuss the results of that just a little bit enough information to be enticing for for our listeners and for me yeah okay super but being serious i think that the future is in mr in mr guided procedures for a lot of things sparing radiation having the possibility to do a real time a real time treatment up to now i do injection with mr i do biopsy soft tissue biopsy with MR because there are fully titanium needles. There are fully titanium true cut bioptic needles. So we can do it. And I know it's hard. I know it's difficult. And there are, believe me, there are a lot, a lot of problems that we are facing from one year from the metallic things that are inside the ink of the scrubs that we wear that can distort the magnetic field to the devices that we can use to the position of the patient, even to understanding the entry point or the coil you have to use. It's hard. It's difficult. But, I mean, if it's not difficult, mm. you know, it's not exciting. The only exciting things in life are things that are difficult. Easy things are for all, all people. We are neuroradiologists. We prefer to do more tough things, more difficult things. That's the, the salt of life. Absolutely. And uh, your career has really shown that. You, you've, throughout your career, really been pushing these at the vanguard of the state of the art, which is fantastic. And I do want to highlight for our audience one of the resources that you've made available, which is, I'll show here, it's the New Procedures in Spinal Interventional Neuroradiology Series published by Springer. And I acquired these books. At least one of them wasn't wasn't very easy to find. 
So it, it's kind of a shame, but I've been telling my colleagues about these books. I think they're so great because aside from explaining the fundamental problems and you've got a volume on spinal instability, the disc and degenerative disc disease, vertebral lesions, and of course, spinal canal stenosis. And you and the other authors go into great depth discussing the biomechanical underpinnings of these cross-modality imaging discussing all modalities from x-ray through, of course, CT and MRI. And so I love these because I haven't found any text that really approaches it in the same way of starting with that foundation and then going into the treatments and using excellent, excellent images of pre-op, intra-op imaging. So I really have to recommend this resource and, and I thank you for putting it together. And one thing I do want to say, though, is like we discussed before we started recording, at least one of the books is from 2015. And while it still has, in a lot of ways, up-to-date information and stuff that we're actually still waiting to get in the U.S., a lot has happened in the last seven years or so. So do you have anything anything new planned, any any new texts that we'll see on in the horizon? Springer contacted me. I don't love textbooks, generally speaking, because textbooks, whatever they are printed, they are old. That's why I try to do a sort of an instant book and a very practical book. I mean, I pract I'm, I'm, a, I'm a practical man, so I didn't want to create the typical 1,000 you know, mm. pages book. And we'll, we'll I show the thickness. This is, this is the approximate thickness of the book Yes, here. exactly. So, okay. Yeah, something yeah, that volume you have to, is a, to, to, 115 pages. Yes, exactly. But, I mean, if you are able to say something in 100 pages you should be able to say the same things in 10. So the idea was to create something very, very practical for people. Number two, okay, we have to renew it. Springer contacted me last year. Honestly, I didn't have so many times. This year was very, very crowded because we started after the COVID. We have a mess of our conferences. And so we restarted. But Springer told me, please, we still have a lot of people that buy it. Renew it, simply renew it. And I, 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 I do promise I, I will do it, particularly introducing the new stuff, the new things, the new diagnostic results we have. Same structure, but I'm in mean, uh, new fashion. Excellent. Well, excited to hear that and definitely look forward to getting my hands on a, a physical copy of the next edition. I'll have to bring it to you to get signed uh, in Italy at one of the ES and R courses. And that, that's one of the, that's the last thing I want to talk about is you're known for putting on a fantastic training course in Europe. And you resumed this year in your home base of Catania. And so tell the audience a little bit about the European Spine School and what it's all about. I mean, you know, this was something that I invented, honestly, when I became the chair for spine. Because the Church for Spine for the European Society has to do every year the conventional course. Okay, I, I do it. It's easy. It's a course. It's a congress. It's easy. But the, from an interventional point of view, I think that people want to do something, to move the hands. The power of the hands-on. So I create this hands-on, and it's a four-day hands-on. And I, I named it the SNR Full Spine Hands-On Courses. Then there were so many people that want to come, and unfortunately, so many people that we weren't able to host all of them. Because on the other hand, if you want to have a successful hands-on, you cannot be 100 people. Maximum, we accept 20, 25. Because we subdivide people in four to five rooms. So if you are in a, in a room with other 10 people, probably in one hour, you will not have sufficient time to do something. So my idea was, number one, few people. Number two, a lot of tutors. Tutors coming from all over the world. There are a lot of tutors coming from the US. Doug, that is a sort of a twin I have in the United States because we do the same things. I'm so friends with Doug and with Josh and with all the other guys from the United States. And this is my second family, honestly. So we have a lot of tutors. And for people that want to approach spinal interventional, it's marvelous. I mean, if I was one of them, I would be very excited because I spent four days talking with people that are so skilled 
asking everything I want and doing practically things not on cadavers, but on, on phantoms. Phantom, I decided phantoms for a lot of things. Number one, okay, there are a lot of people that come from different area, geographical area. So people are not supposed to touch cadaver according to their religion. Okay. But honestly, phantoms are better than cadavers. According to me, they are more similar to human body than a cadaver, paradoxically. Yeah, yeah I agree. I agree with that. So, I, sorry, I just had to jump in and that been a lot of cadaver labs in, in my time since med school. And that's that there's always this suspension of disbelief when you're practicing some sort of surgical technique. It's with all, all respect to the people who provide their bodies for science. And I think it still is an important part of our medical training. But it, it seems to me that the future is what you're, of training courses is what you're talking about, which is hyper-realistic phantoms. Definitely. New phantoms are honestly identical. I even feel the resistance when I inject something. And this is the same resistance we have in the human body. So we created this four hands-on, four days and so on. Okay, I named it European. So I did one in France, one in Malta. Then I did it one in my hometown. And everything changed, honestly. All the, the feedback was so positive that we as European society decided to keep it fixed in my hometown in Italy, honestly, for one simple thing. It's four days. And in four days, we use ultrasounds machine, angiography, CR, CT, MR. Okay, if you want to block four days a full radiological department or neuroradiological department in a normal hospital, mm, would be difficult. Thanks God, I work in a private public hospital. So, my manager loved me. Probably I'm, I'm a, a nice guy. I don't know. But for doing my hands-on, honestly, believe me, he blocked the entire activity of the, my institute. Because when we do the hands-on, even the examination that people does, patient does for doing other kind of surgery, okay, they don't do it. They cannot do. So we have the full building for us. It's magic. But it's something difficult. Yeah, it's amazing. But it's something difficult to obtain in a conventional hospital. In a conventional hospital, you can have an emergency. You can have a trauma. You can have, a, I don't know, an emergency. In my hospital, thanks God, there is no ER because it's private. So we can work for days and nobody disturb us. So this is really important. Then trying to face the fact that we admit only 25 people and we have a waiting list, I created the Middle East version. The Middle East version, I did it last, last year in Qatar. Next year should be around March in Qatar back again because they gave us so many facilities that it was super. But I noticed that in, in the Middle East came a lot of spine surgeons, orthopedic surgeons, neurosurgeons. So it's a little little bit different target. We are trying to create the neuroradiology in the Middle East. And I'm very proud for the fact that one of my fellows, he stayed with me, he is from Doha, he stayed with me for one year and a half, and now he is the head department of neuro, the first neuroradiological department in Qatar. So I created the neuroradiology in Qatar. He was very proud about it. It's amazing. So we duplicate this course. But the main course is the four days where we literally show everything, every kind of vertebroplasty, every kind of brand of vertebroplasty, every kind of screws, spacer, tumor ablation, even things that got not the CE market. Last year, for example, I showed the tripod that is similar to the spine jack. Okay, at that time, we didn't have this, the CE, so we people know the things, use the things, but they cannot use in practical activity. Nowadays, there is the C market. So I will start to use this new, new stuff. But my goal is not only to show people what they can do, but what they will do, will be able to. So what's, it's really new. Okay, we, we try to show it in the answer. And honestly, we receive an extremely positive feedback, not only from the tutors, they enjoy it, 
okay, Sicily is a nice place, come on. Nice weather, nice food, nice life, nice life in my city. So tutors come and, and they, uh, they enjoy. They work a lot because they work all the day. I mean, 12 hours. Believe me, it's difficult. It's hard. Even for me, you have to be prepared, physically prepared, okay? But participants enjoy it a lot. But even sponsors, they do love it because they show the product and it's a way to come in contact with people. It's even a way to ameliorate the product. So it's a, I think that it's a perfect combination of coming all together and try to improve our, I mean, our activity, our job. So that's why I'm so enthusiastic about the Anson. That's why we will repeat definitely this experience in 2023. I think that it will be in September because October sometimes it's crazy. This year it's summertime, but sometimes we can have even a storm. September in Sicily is perfect. Not too hot. You can go to the swim in the sea. If you want to go to, to, to ski on the volcano, you can. sometimes you can go skiing in the morning and swimming on the sea in the afternoon, in the same day. <laughs> it's a strange city, but it's a funny. It's funny. Well, that's, that's amazing. That course sounds unbelievable. And uh, I'll have to get on the waiting list for next year. Oh, sure. You will be. You have to. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So <laughs> I, I did want to get that out there because I think it's, it just sounds like one of the best training courses in the world. There's no question we have to uh, get one together in the U.S. I don't think we have anything quite like that yet. We have a few, quite a few training courses through different societies and things, but nothing quite on the super cutting edge in that concentrated fashion. So, and of course, being able to have your facilities in Catania and play at home base and have all your equipment. That sounds, that sounds really nice too. And I'm happy because believe me, at least two people on 25 that come for the course, come back for the, for, for the next one. And they ask to do an internship in my department for one month or one year. I don't care. So I'm very happy about the fact that in my department, I always have at least two or three foreign people, I mean, colleagues that come from all over the world. It's good for me. I learn a lot because I discuss, I discuss with young guys. I'm not so young, unfortunately, but I discuss with them. It's funny. It's even funny the fact that in my department, all people talk just in English. English is the first language. We've, even for, from my technician, from my nurses, they are young and, and they are so excited by the fact that there are always people coming from abroad. So in comparison to the other departments like surgery, oncological surgical departments, they feel a little bit, you know, high class level because they say, okay, I'm a sort of a Vatican. So I sort of a state in the state. Okay, my department is a, it's the Vatican department in my institute because we speak in English. It's something, we do something different. It's funny, it's funny, it's funny. And what's more important, being serious, we motivate people. I try to transmit to people the love that I have for my job because honestly, if you don't love your job, you will not be able to have a success. I mean, I always considered spine intervention on irradiology, not medicine, but an art. I'm an Italian guy, so I come from an artistic place. So if you consider your job as an art, this is the key of success, and people understand it. Patient, colleagues, your technician, everyone understand that there is something special in what you do. And I'm very, very proud, not about the success in treatments, obviously I am. I am proud by the fact that I see that more and more and more people come in my department. That's probably one of the best medals that one can have on, you know, stick on your scraps, I think. I don't know, Jacob, if you are, if you agree, but it's something that, I mean, it's our fuel. It's, our fuel is not money. Come on. If I would earn more money, I, I have to change my job and do for example, I do the influencer. Influencer earn a lot of money in Italy on the internet. But it's not for a question of money. It's a question of love. So it's something that you cannot control. 
love cannot be controlled. Absolutely. And that, that passion definitely comes through in your work and what you've accomplished in your career and just in this entire conversation. And I want to thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, it's now after 9 p.m. in Italy. Thank you for staying up and discussing with us. It's been a fantastic conversation and uh, we've covered a lot of ground. And I just want to ask, do you have any final thoughts, any final comments before we sign off? No, I mean, the final comment is, according to me, we are opening a new gate, like in a sci-fi movie, you know. I think, honestly, that our job, we are not at the end of a story. We are just opening a new story. Spinal intervention on radiology definitely will increase in the future. And Cinderella is dead. Coming back to the Cinderella syndrome, nowadays is not time for Cinderella. Nowadays is time probably for Wonder Woman. That is a woman, but is powerful, strong, and unbreakable. Okay, now I have the Wonder Woman syndrome, not Cinderella anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, fantastic. I, I love that. I think I think it's a great metaphor. And, and so we'll leave off there. We will make sure to link to all the studies that we discuss, as well as some links to the ESNR Spine School. So our listeners can try to fight each other to get on the wait list for that when it opens up for next year. And so I'll conclude. You will be the first. You will be the first to know. You will be the first Fantastic. to know. I promise. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we'll end there. Thank you again so much, Dr. Manfrey. And to our listeners, until next time, thanks for tuning in. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Don. Michael Barraza and Ali Behetti. Our audio team lead is Karen Gannon with support from Caleb Hodson, Josh McWhorter, and Ness Smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. Article and transcript support by Taylor Robinson and Delaney Aguilar. Social media and PR by Ann Dang. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.